Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our 2020 Intro to Data Science Workshop. Uh, my name is Akil, and I'll kind of be helping moderate and answer questions. Um, right next to me is Professor Wade. He'll be kind of doing most of the workshop stuff. So without further ado, I'll let him take it away. Hey, thanks, Akil. So this is the Intro to Data Science Workshop. I had the privilege to be able to present data science and um, with you and really give like a real introductory overview of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides with you. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started on just this little workshop. And I think all of you guys have a link to ask questions. Definitely ask questions anytime you have any questions. My goal is to make this really, really interactive and play around with a really fun data set. So, I'm Wade Fagan-Omshire. I'm a teaching associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. You might have seen some of my work before, either on my 91 DVOC website, which visualizes the spread of the coronavirus, or on the GPA visualizations, which visualize the GPAs at UIUC across all of the different courses that I keep updated every single semester. In addition to this, I've made a lot of visualizations. The 91 DVOC in particular has gone viral, used by governors. Um, but there's been a bunch of other work that I've been able to work on with visualization. And at the core of all of this visualization is a story and is data science. So we're going to nerd out with some data here. And I thought one of the best data sets to nerd out with is a data set that we can all relate to and a data set that we can really tell a story in. So in this first data set um, that we're going to look at, I recommend that you get involved with this data set with me. Like I wanna nerd out with you on this data set. So I definitely recommend that you install um, Python 3 on your computer if you're doing data science at all, that working on your computer lets you deal with ginormous data sets. You're not limited to any cloud computing environment. It's also great for large computational tasks because like um, cloud environments like Google Colab that allows you to run Python and data science in the cloud has these strict limits. So if you do love data science, definitely install on your local machine. That's how I do all of my programming. But Google Colab is a great way to get started. And we can, um, and I'm gonna actually use Google Colab as part of this talk because this is something you can access as well. So um, we'll link Google Colab in the chat so that you can access Google Colab and um, you can just bring up an open empty notebook and I'll let you do that um, while I kind of go over where we're going to start because every great visualization begins with a story. So with the story, I want to tell you the story of the Allison family in the year 1912. So this is a family where of four, there is Hudson and Bessie. So Hudson, 30-year-old male, Bessie, 25-year-old female in the year 1912. They had two children. They had the children of Helen and Hudson Jr. were their two children, two years old and 11 months old. And we know a lot about the Allison family. So the Allison family, we know they embarked for on the ship, the Titanic, in um, Scott, in Southampton, England, on April 12th, 1912. And we also know that their ticket was number 113781. And that ticket allowed two adults and two children on the boat for a total cost of 151 pounds. Their cabins was cabin C22 and C26. These were first class cabins, kind of the finest accommodations you can get on a Titanic. And their destination was to take the ship across the ocean to the to various cities in Canada. So we've got this great detailed information about these passengers on the Titanic. But as I'm sure you know, the Titanic was a ship that is one of the most notable disasters of the 1900s. So we can actually look at this story as data. And that's what data science is all about. It's saying, let's take events that we can describe and we can understand. And actually, let's put data to it. So one thing I want to relate in data science is I want to figure out what attributes can I find out about this family. So in this family, Hudson had a wife. So his wife, so we're going to label these as siblings or spouses. So how many siblings or spouses did they have on their trip on board the Titanic? So Hudson had one spouse. 
um, Bessie, and she was on the ship with Hudson. And the second piece of data, data we can label about every family we know about is we can label the total number of parents or children aboard. So there are two parents or children. So Hudson had two children. So this was Helen and Hudson Jr. were the two children of Hudson. And we've got all of this data about this family. So we've got this data, we've got all of these different fields, and we're gonna wanna take all of these fields and do some data science with this. So we've got all of these fields, but we also have one more field. So the last field that we also have is we have the field on whether or not each of these individual um, people survived the crash of the Titanic. Unfortunately, we learned that Hudson did not, but we're gonna learn that hundreds of others were able to survive the wreck of the Titanic. So the Titanic, it's really made up of a number of individual stories like the Allison family. And we're gonna explore a data set that has over a thousand different families that boarded the Titanic together and look at their journey through it. And we're not gonna do it by looking at the data individually, but instead we're gonna learn how to use Python and do a little bit of data science to really nerd out with this data and dive deep into it. So this is the data set. And this data set allows us to look at all of the variables that we just saw about the person. And there's a total of 1,309 total passengers. And this data was sourced from Kegel, which is um, a big data science platform that has tons of great data sets. And in fact, um, Kegel actually has a fantastic contest going on where you can build machine learning algorithms to actually predict the survivability on a test and a training set of data. We're not going to go that far, but if you wanted to go further with this data set, there's great resource variable in Kaggle, and there's a ton of other tutorials. But this will really get you familiar with this data set so that we can really work on it. So I'm going to share this link with you um, via so um, let me figure out a great way to sort of copy and paste this link for you. Um, so I'm going to link it in my chat, and I think it will get relayed over to you guys. And this will awesome. So I'll try and link everything I'm doing in chat so that you have this as well so that you can click any of these links so they're very accessible uh, because I really want you to kind of work on this data set with me and really spend the next 30 minutes actually diving into this data. So there's a few key ideas that we're gonna start working with before we even get into the data because I want you to completely understand and this is great for any software project of where we want to go. So the key ideas is data science is about, is only as good as the story you can tell. So the story that you can tell is going to be how you can share your date, the data with other people. So if you can't, if all you have is numbers, no one's gonna be very interested in those numbers. Instead, you wanna actually tell a story. You wanna share why is this data meaningful and why is the insight that you've shown really, really, really valuable. And in doing that, you'll be able to um, have a much better ability to share what you're working on. Um, for an educated technical audience, just like this hackathon, throwing an algorithm at data is not good enough. Like you could throw a random forest or a multi-level neural net at data, but data interpretability is a growing area of computer science and data science that's super, super important. If you can't interpret what's going on with your algorithm, your data at the end is not going to be very valuable. Unless you're gonna have a model that's completely blind to the user, you're going to have to be able to interpret what that data is and share with users how to actually engage with this data. And the third bit is this session is really only about basic data science. Exploring how you can use tools to create interpretable data science. There's so much more you can do with this data. So we're just really going to uh, begin with this surface level data without going too deep at all. But don't be limited to just where we stop here. Definitely go way more with this data. So 
I want to go ahead and have us all work on Google Colab. So Akil, did we get the Colab link in chat? Yep, I sent the Colab link in chat. Awesome. So what you'll have is you'll have a, um, a screen that looks like the screen I have right here where you have a blank notebook. So if you've, um, you'll wanna go ahead and create a new notebook. And the first thing we're gonna dive into is how we actually read data in data science. And almost universally, everyone loves this library called Pandas. And I think of Pandas as sort of programming with Excel, but in Python. So Excel is extremely powerful. You can do all sorts of math, statistics, all sorts of stuff with Excel, but as your data set gets large, you're not gonna to wanna to use Excel. But using Pandas is a great way to sort of nerd out with data and have programmatic access to data. So what we'll do is every time we use Pandas, we always have to start with importing the library. So we'll type import Pandas as PD, and then we'll go ahead and read in the data set by um, doing PD, the Pandas library dot read CSV. So you have this in um, here. So I'm going to type exactly this code, import pandas as PD, and then PD is equal to, or sorry, DF is equal to PD.readCSV. And then we can read um, the Titanic data set off my website. So I'm going to go and just paste this in and zoom this in a little bit for you. And in doing this, by running just these two blocks of code, we have the entire data set read in here inside of Python. So basically, you can just think of this as an Excel spreadsheet. There's nothing scary about it. There's nothing intimidating about it. It's only the data. Each row is one piece of data, just like you see in Excel. And each column is just one column of data, just like you see in Excel. And in fact, right here at the top of the, the top of the file, we can see the Allison family. So we can look at these um, three peoples or these four people. So we can see that um, we have um, Bessie Allison, 25 year old female, and all of the data that we described about her right here in this data set. And we can see that she paid 151 pounds and for her ticket for the four of them. So we have every single passenger on the Titanic loaded into our data set. And I think what will be even easier is I'm gonna share this entire presentation. Um, with chat so that if you're following along, you also can access this presentation to be able to even more easily copy and paste the code that we're gonna go through. So what we've done is we have worked with pandas to um, get in this, to get the data loaded in. The very first thing I'm gonna do anytime I work with a pandas data set is I'm going to do a describe function. So one of the most simple things about data science is you always wanna understand what your data is all about. So whenever you're working with pandas, you have a data frame, you can do df.describe, and that's going to give you an exploratory data analysis view of your data. So this is taking every single numeric column, and in this numeric column, it is looking at basic statistics about all of the data. So this includes the class, so first class, second class, third class, so we can see there is a total of 1,309 data entries about um, what class of passengers each passenger was. And question. Yeah. Quick question. Um, somebody is saying they don't have access to that to that uh, presentation. Hmm. Uh, Let me see what I can do real fast. Is an Illinois account required to view it? It shouldn't be. Okay, I think I accessed it to... I 
think we're good. Can we, can you guys try it again and give us a thumbs up if that works? Should be the same link, hopefully. Hmm. No luck? They're still saying it does not work. All right, let's try. Okay, wait. Um... I think it should be working. Yep, it's working. Awesome. Sorry about that. Zoom calls are always tough, but I think the presentation is definitely the way to go. Awesome. So what we'll have, so what we've done is we've loaded in the data set. We've imported the pandas library. We've loaded in the data set. We have the entire data set inside a variable called df. And now we're doing df.describe, which describes all of the data in a data set. So p class is the person in the class it's in. First class, second class, third class. We can see the minimum class is one and the maximum class is three. And we can see the 50th percentile is actually third class. So that means over half the passengers were in um, third class where um, and over, and less than a quarter of the passengers were in first class cabins. So you can see that we've got three different classic cabins. Um, we have data on whether or not it survived. And we can see that survived is sim simply a binary variable, zero or one. And only about a third of the people that we have data on survived the wreck of the Titanic. Um, we can look at the average age, slightly under 30. We can look at the average number of siblings or parents or sorry, siblings or spouses, um, the average number of parents or um, children. And then we can look at the average price as well as um, an identifier number that's not gonna be that valuable to us. So these are all the numeric fields inside of our data. So by doing df.describe, we're able to really dive into this data. So what we can do next is really look at the data and find that some data didn't display in our uh, dot describe. And what you'll find the first rule of data science is categorical data makes our life really difficult. There's nothing worse than categorical data. So if we have a category that we can make a number, we wanna make everything a number. So in doing that, SKLearn is this great data science library. So it stands for scikit-learn and people just say SKLearn. And it's a data science goldmine of just useful algorithms. It is my go-to tool whenever I'm doing any data science. And one of my favorite features of data of SKLearn is the label encoder. So label encoder, this fourth, um, this block of co code labeled four is this um, is a algorithm that will label all of the data that we provide it with a numeric value. So it's simply gonna see the first unique value, it's gonna map it to a number. The second unique value, it's gonna map it to another number. Third unique value, it's gonna map it to a third number. So it's gonna simply take categories and map them to numbers in a single line of code. So once we import the label encoder, I'm gonna go ahead and encode the sex of the passenger as a uh, variable inside our data frame. So the first thing we need to do is we definitely need to import the uh, sklearn pre-processing library and get the label encoding algorithm. And once we have the label encoding algorithm, I'm going to go ahead and just run this by saying df at the new column name. So here I've got df at sex encoded. So that's gonna be the column name that I'm gonna call the encoded value of the sex of the passenger. And that is gonna be a new instance of my label encoder. So label encoder open close parentheses dot fit underscore transform. And then the argument it gets is gonna be the column of my data frame that I wanna encode. So I wanna encode the sex column to sex encoded to get the sex of the passenger. And then I'm gonna go ahead and print out that data frame. So what happens here is I've gone ahead and printed out the data frame and I should see another column. And one great idea is some tutorials you'll see will replace that sex column with the number. So anytime they encode it, they go ahead and replace the original column. I never do this because it's always great to keep your original data around. 
So it can't hurt to add extra columns. Um, don't, in general, don't overwrite existing columns. So one thing we can do since we have both columns is we can see sex encoded, we can see the first value is zero, the second value is one. So this should, and then the third value is zero. So sh this should correspond to different sexes of the individual. So the first value is zero, then one, then zero. Scrolling back over, we have female, male, female. So what we know is the label encoder algorithm saw the sex of female and encodes that as zero and the sex of male and encodes that as one. So that's going to be the encoding scheme that it used. And we can always look back to a row and look over to the sex column to find out what the sex of the individual is as opposed to just the encoded value. Somebody has a quick question about yeah. um, data real quick. Why is the data for siblings and spouses combined and the same for children and parents? So that's a really great question. And to be honest, I don't know. Um, I tried to look for data that had them separated, but it seems like all the data sets that's available on this data always combines them. So yeah, I wish it was separated because I think that could be some interesting variables um, because obviously you may have both a sibling and a parent on the ship. Um, so, or a sibling and a spouse, sorry. So like you may have both a sibling and a spouse on the ship. And in fact, if we look at describe, um, and actually this makes it, before we even scroll up to look at describe, we now have a new numeric column. We have this sex encoded column. So let's actually do a new describe. So I'm gonna do df.describe again. And we'll see that df.describe will always in real time give us the data about every numeric column. So now we have a sex encoded column. So we know the sex of each individual. And remember zero is female, one was male. So with the average of being 0.64, we know that males outnumbered four females um, almost two to one. Um, but yeah, so definitely like sibling and spouses, one person had eight siblings or spouses on board. So we obviously won't be able to tell what a sibling, which one of them are siblings, which one of them is a spouse. So most of the time it's just one or zero, which makes it really easy to look at. But yeah, I wish we had more data, but unfortunately part of data science is often we have to deal with the data that we've got. And if you're able to find a better data set for this, I would love to see it um, because I'm definitely, this is one of my favorite data sets to work with. So if you can get a better version of it, I would love it. So what we've done is we've now taken data and we've loaded it in, we've used df.describe to get an overview of the data, and we've used the label encoder to transform categorical data to numeric data. So that allows us to explore a lot more about this data. So, and we've already done a new df.describe. Um, So we can see that we now have exactly matching columns. So one of the things that I love to do is I love data visualization. So anytime you have data, the first thing you should do as soon as you've sort of cleaned up the data is just start visualizing it. Have fun with the data, really understand what you're looking at. Because you can make really, really powerful plots in Python in just a few lines of code. So we're going to import two different libraries. Um, I love Seaborn. So Seaborn is not the default library that um, a lot of people use in Python. Uh, the default library in Python is a library called matplotlib, which you can see that second import. Seaborn actually builds on top of matplotlib. So it still uses matplotlib, but it adds a lot more plots that you don't have in just base matplotlib. So we're going to use Seaborn, which you import Seaborn as SNS. And then um, you go ahead and say import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. So that's going to give us some plotting functionality that we're going to use a little bit later. So how Seaborn works is we can render everything, everything we type in an individual cell in a Jupyter notebook or um, inside Google Colab is going to be rendered together on the same plot when we use Seaborn. 
So what that means is if I go over here and I do, um, if I go ahead and use my distribution plotter, the disk plot, is I can say SNS dot disk plot, or I need to grab my imports, SNS dot disk plot, and then I'm gonna do a disk plot of the age. So what was the age of people on the ship? So what Seaborn has given me, it's given me a distribution of the age of every single person on the ship. You can see there was a lot of infants, infants um, some children, most of the people were between the ages of 20 and 40, and you had um, a fair number of people between 40 and 60, and it really tailed off as you get, got from 60 to 80. So what we can use, do is we can split up this data set into any size chunks that we want and really show off how um, this, da this data looks. So we're going to split this up in a second, but right now I'm just going to work in this single cell and say, let's look at the survivability of people of a given age um, versus whether or not they survived or not. So I'm going to do that by plotting it twice. So my first plot is going to be DF, and I'm going to subset DF by saying, I only want DF where the um, sex is male. Or no, I'm going to do survive first. So I'm going to go ahead and see what is my survive column call? It's called survived. So I'm going to say where df of survived is equal to one. So this is going to be everyone survived charting the age. So this is a graph of only the survival survivors. But I'm going to do the exact same thing on the exact same cell and say df survived is equal to zero. And that's going to plot two things on the exact same plot. So what we see is we have two plots. One is the plot of everyone who survived by age, and the other is a plot of everyone who did not survive. And I'm going to go ahead and make it very clear on which plot um, is the deceased plot by coloring the one where survived equal to zero it should be red. So by doing that, I'm gonna know the red is the people who died and the blue are the people who survived. So what we have here is we've got a graph and you can see that one of the classic sayings is women and children first off the boat. And you can see here that in fact, the children do have a much better rate of survival than, the, um, than almost the rest of the population. That almost by and large, the red lines are larger for almost every single bin of data, except for those children and infants, that they survive their rate two or three times the rate of other people. So we can see this in the data. We can see that definitely children were saved on the ship of the Titanic more than um, almost every other class of people. You can see that some people, like right around the 50s, there's this inversion that you wouldn't expect. Um, one thing you can do is you can, the only other argument I use all the time here is sometimes you need more bins to get more details. So I can say bins is equal to 20, and you're going to want to use the same size bins on each of these. So I can say 20 bins, and it's going to give me more granular bins. Um, I'm going to even go to 30 bins. So that's going to be how many different lines we see on this graph. So you can get more and more granular detail. And Python does a great job of sort of giving you good defaults. So you can definitely adjust the number of bins. I don't think it's necessary here. You're able to really get a good story without it, but that's a great way to work on it. So if you have any questions, definitely type them in the chat. I um, and Akil and the team are definitely looking out for those. Um, but one thing that I think is really useful that I do a ton in data science is to go ahead and dive into subsets of this data. So what you'll see here is I ended up kind of subsetting the data right in line. This gets really messy really fast. And so there's going to be two categories of people that I think we might care about because we know that children definitely um, were, had a lower fatality rate than non-children. But we, the saying is that women and children first. 
So let's go ahead and say the female is a data frame where we just look at all of the data where the sex is equal to female and male is a data frame where the sex of the person is equal to male. So we're gonna go ahead and create two sub data frames. And what we now have here after running this line is every time you do something, I always love to check to make sure it works how I expect it to work. So here I'm gonna look at a female data frame and I see that everyone listed is indeed female. Awesome. So this is what I expected to see. And let's make sure that my mail worked. Everyone I see is also listed in mail, great. So now what we can do is we can actually look at the graphs of, let's look at the fatality graph of males and the fatality graph of females on the Titanic. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use this code I typed right up here and copy and paste code because the best code to use is code you don't have to, um, that you are know that already works. So instead of looking at data frames, I'm gonna look at what is the survival graph of females by age. So exact same graph as before, except for now I'm looking at females. So here is the female fatality rate. And that looks a little bit different. So now there's some features about this graph. Now children and infants actually have a greater fatality than the fatality of some of the older women. So if you're, um, and in fact, in most categories, you see the blue line tipping above the red line. So we can see that there's definitely some indication that females had a, a higher survivability rate, especially in certain age demographics on the Titanic. Let's look at this data on males. Let's see if we see a similar trend or if the data looks completely different. So same code, replacing the female data set with the male data set. And, oh, interesting completely different. So if you're an infant male, you had a really high chance of surviving. An infant or child male, like the age of 10 or so or below. But then most of um, an adult males had a higher fatality rate than those who survived. So there's some really interesting stories to be told about this data and to dive into it more. And Seaborn is just this great tool that every single thing you put in a single cell, you can type as many graphs as you want in that cell. And in doing that, you're actually able to graph many things on the same axis or on the same grid. So this allows you to kind of superimpose data on top of each other. And it's a great way to kind of compare data sets. And this is one of the reasons I love Seaborn, that literally in just a couple lines of code, we were able to create these graphs that have this deep, deep level of detail. And there's tons of different Seaborn visualizations. So if you've never played around with Seaborn, if you've used to Matplotlib, plot, um, I definitely recommend trying out Seaborn, playing around with it. Seaborn really is designed around the idea of making graphs really easily. Um, and of course, if you ever need anything, the nice thing is Seaborn is just built on top of Matplotlib. So you can, um, you still got all of the Matplotlib stuff. So you can go ahead and use Matplotlib just like um, before, if you're familiar with Matplotlib. We have one quick question here. Yeah. What does the y-axis represent in this data set? Ah, so the y-axis here on this visualization is the percentage of people in each bin. So what you have here is the total area under the blue curve and the total area under the red curve are, is a total of one. So it is, it's a distribution. So all distributions have to add up to one. So the area underneath the curve is a total of one. So you can view the y-axis as what percentage of people um, are in that bin. So um, this is going off just total memory, but I think we can do, oh, sorry. Um, I think it's, we'll try it. We're actually, 
Um, one nice thing about Colab is it will let us um, see all the different things that, so hist is false. So by default, it's gonna give us a histogram view, which is a distribution. And my guess is if I do hist equals false here, oh, that's just gonna display the histogram. There's definitely a way, um, I'd have to look it up. I don't know it off the top of my head um, to display the raw underlying data instead of displaying the distribution. So um, there's a lot of parameters that you can play with inside a histogram, which makes it a really, really powerful tool to look at um, all the different parameters inside of this plot. So, and if this plot doesn't do it, there's gonna be other Seaborn plots that do it. But I generally always look at things as percentages because it does give you kind of a perspective of what part of the data is there there. And um, that by the time you get down to the far right-hand side that you have less than one half of 1%, um, it's a pretty small part of the population. So that's a great question. Um, and I can look afterwards on how to actually get that y-axis to be raw numbers and follow up. So we've got data visualization and data visualization is an important part of sharing the story. And I would say half of what you see in data science is the visualization side of it. And you can use things like D3JS to really interact with data, um, to make data, inter data visualizations interactive, which is how I build my other data visualizations. But often any visualization I build starts out with Python, starts out with playing around in Seaborn. So we've looked at data subsets, you've got the code for that, we did exactly that. And now I wanna go on to sort of the last main thing and really get into the uh, more machine learning and artificial intelligence side of it. We're gonna focus mostly on machine learning here, but all of the scikit-learn stuff we're gonna use also has um, some artificial intelligence that can be added on top of that. So one thing is messy data is gonna cause some algorithms to fail. So the algorithms we're gonna deal with um, today and most simple data science algorithms need clean data as input. So if we look at this data, we can see in our data set that line 1305, if we look at our data frame, has a missing age. The age is NAN, which stands for not a number, which is just Python's way of saying the data you gave me isn't a number. I can't make sense of it. I can't convert it to an age. So in having this data.NAN, we can uh, look at this data and clean it up. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of all of the data columns where we don't know information about the age. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simply use a drop in A and I'm gonna drop in A based on just a subset of my data because I don't wanna drop all of the rows that are missing. I just wanna drop all of the rows that are missing the subset of missing data in the age column. So I'm gonna transform my data set to be a data set that has fewer rows. So I am losing data here, which if I'm really like doing this analysis, I'm gonna to wanna to go back and put in this data or use different algorithms that are more robust to missing data, especially if I'm dropping a lot of data. So if I look at my DF, my DF says I've got 1,309 um, rows of data. So I'm gonna say DF equals DF dot drop in A, on parentheses subset equals open array age. So I'm gonna drop data which is missing an age and now I have 1,046 rows. So I've got 1,046 total rows in this data set. So I've dropped some data, um, about 300 rows it looks like by using drop in A. So 1309 down to 1046, so a little under 300 rows. But now what I have is I have really clean data. So I've got 1,046 rows where the data is almost perfect. We have almost complete information about all of the people, about 1,046 of the Titanic passengers. So this is going to be the data set that I'm going to use to um, build a uh, machine learning algorithm on top of. And as I promised you in the beginning, we're going to focus on interpretability. 
So I'm not gonna give you an algorithm where we can't understand the results. Instead, we're gonna get an algorithm that we can really, really dive into those results. So one of the simplest forms of machine learning is the idea of a decision tree. So a decision tree is an algorithm that answers the question, what binary decision gives me the most information about the outcome I'm trying to predict? So, what, so if I look at all the data, what data best divides the data into two different categories? And all input data in decision trees must be numeric so that we can make a binary decision on it. And what I need to do is I need to go ahead and create an input data frame that only has my numeric values. Because if I give a decision tree algorithm data that's not numeric, that algorithm is going to end up dying and causing an error. So I'm going to create a new data frame called DF input that only has numeric values. So this is going to be just the columns of my data set that are numeric. So in doing so, I'm going to go over back to my Colab notebook. And my DF underscore input is going to be my DF open square brackets. And then inside the DF square brackets, I'm going to have an array of all the columns I want to include. So that's P class, the class of the person's cabin, the age, the number of siblings, the um, number of parents, and the encoded value for the sex of the person. So remember, we, we're not taking the male female values, we're taking the zero one values. And then I'm creating a new data frame called DF input. And I can look at this DF input and I see that every column I have is a numeric column. So we've got all of this data and we can see we still have the Allison family right here that we had complete information about them and they were um, ID number one, two, three, and four. So we have that Allison family still with us in this data frame. And the one column I didn't include here is the column I wanna predict. I wanna predict whether or not they survived. So you always wanna leave out the column you're trying to predict in your input because if you have the column you're trying to predict, um, it's gonna learn that that's exactly the column that it needs to do or needs to use because that will 100% correctly predict the outcome. So based on only these columns, I wanna train a model to learn what's the best way to predict the survivability of people based on that input. And that's the basis of all data science or all machine learning algorithms is I'm going to fit some model and have it learn the characteristics about data on some training input. So for these 1000 people, we have data about whether or not they survived. So to do this, like everything else we've seen, we only need to focus on a couple lines of code. So we're gonna do two things. We're gonna grab the sklearn decision tree classifier, initialize the classifier, and then go ahead and fit that classifier. So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and import the decision tree classifier from sklearn.tree. And then I'm gonna create a new classifier, which is equal to a decision tree classifier. And I've gone ahead and put max depth equal three inside of here. So in doing this, I'm gonna say, let's make a tree that only has a height of three. And by doing that, it's gonna let us be able to visualize this really cleanly. The tree is gonna go really, really deep if you don't have a max depth because it's gonna try and overfit the actual data. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and fit the input data given the data about the survival. So every single algorithm you use in sklearn will always follow this same idea. You'll always have a classifier in sklearn and they will always have a dot fit function. And dot fit function will always take at least two parameters. The first parameter is going to be the input. And the second parameter is going to be the known output. So this is the data you know to be true. So we know the DF inputs all of our numeric data. And we know DF survived is whether or not that person survived. So we've got this great classifier that we're going to go ahead and fit. And Python does its thing, and it gives us a bunch of debugging output. So this is an interpretable. Um, we can do a classifier.predict to predict new things. But the reason we use decision trees 
is because decision trees give us the ability to interpret data. So there's this really great um, library called Plot Tree that's part of SKLearn. So SKLearn is going to allow us to plot a tree of our decision tree. And it's gonna give us all of the information that's in our decision tree. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do from sklearn.tree, import plot tree. Then I'm gonna go ahead and create a figure that um, is 30 by 30. So this is the one kind of nitty gritty, of, nitty gritty bit of Python that I really wish you didn't have to do. But by default, the plot tree sometimes makes a really, really small visualization that's almost impossible to see. So looking at the plot tree, um, I'm gonna go ahead and import the plot tree library um, and create a figure. Actually, I'm gonna take this figure line down to the next cell block. And then in this figure line, I'm gonna go ahead and do plot tree and dot plot dot show. So I'm gonna plot tree and I'm gonna input the classifier I trained up here. So I had to train this classifier. This is a classifier I trained earlier with all of my Titanic data, putting it in the plot tree and then I'm gonna show the plot. And what we should get is a decision tree that gives us information about what's going on. Okay, that's actually not that useful. Sure, we have an X column, we've got some information, we have the total number of sample, uh, we can do better. So this tree gives us all the data, but I don't know what X at four is. So plot tree is actually even more powerful than that. So plot tree can, spe you can specify a number of different arguments inside of plot tree. So um, I, the final code that I used when I was sort of nerding out with this was adding um, the feature names, which is my data frame input columns and my class names. So this is the two outputs. Um, when survived, when my output data survived is equal to zero, that was um, someone who died. And when my survivor data was equal to one, that was someone who survived. So I correspond that to the output. And I'm gonna say field is equal to true, which gives me just some nice color to the visualization. So I'm gonna go ahead and create the second plot using this exact code. And we're still using plot tree, which is adding a few more arguments on the plot tree. And what we get is the exact same tree. It looks the exact same way, except for what we have now is we've got a lot more detailed information. So what this says is this top node of the tree is the encoded sex. So that means if it's less than 0.5, that was a zero. So those were females. So the most differentiating factor on whether or not you survived on the Titanic is your sex. So this doesn't actually tell us anything about whether or not you survived or not. This just says the feature that most differentiates our data is whether or not you were male or female. And in this, so without looking at this feature, a decision tree is going to tell me what val what data is in this particular cell. So this is going to be our entire data because we're at the root of the tree. So we have all 1,046 samples. And the samples outputs, 619 of them were 0 and 427 of them were 1. So if we had to use a machine learning algorithm that just had to guess at the data without using any information, it would guess that an average person died. Um, we have a quick question from a little yeah. bit ago. Um, is there any way to automatically filter columns by numeric rather than naming them? Um, is, there, is there a way to automatically filter columns by numeric rather than naming them? So not easily. There's a way you can actually ask the columns what type it is and then extract all of the columns that are of a numeric type that are integer or float. Um, but that would require a little bit of looping or a lambda function. Um, I find that unless you have just hundreds of rows, it's going to be much cleaner to name them. By naming them, you also have another advantage because data science is about interpreting the results. It really makes sure that you want to use the columns you're using. Because if you're giving a garbage input column, it's not going to be that useful. Another quick question. Um, how does the decision tree figure out what to be the root node of the tree? Ah, yeah. So the decision tree is decides a root node 
on what gives the greatest information gain. So what, what best splits the data into two halves? And this is this Gini statistic. So this is basically the information gain you get by this decision. So it's gonna look at every possible split and see the information gain. And you're gonna see as you go down the tree, the information gain is going to decrease, that it's a less valuable thing in the whole data set. Um, you can see it may increase for some smaller subsets of the data, but the overall trend is going to be the information, what single thing on the entire data set gains the most information. And the information gain here is the, whether or not you're male or female tell, gives you the most information gain about the predictability of the output. So we know that if we only, if we have no information at all, the best we can do is just assume that person died because 619 of the entire sample set end up deceased, were deceased after the Titanic while 427 survived. But now let's look at the next level of decision tree. So to the left is if this decision tree were true. So if the sex encoded is less than 0.5, that means everything on this left subtree are females. And everything on the right subtree are males. So if we look at just the females, we have 388 females where we knew their age and, all, and had complete information. And of those 388, 96 survived and 292, or sorry, 96 died and 292 survived. So that means if we only know one piece of data, if we only know the sex of the person who was on the Titanic, if they were female, we would be best off guessing that they survived. On the other side, the right subtree says of all the males, 523 of them died and 135 of them survived. So if we knew nothing about the data except for that they were male, we would have said they probably died. And you can see the color encoding tells us that. That blue is a color that says most of the group survived, while orange is a color that says most of the group died. So let's look at just this left, left subtree. So remember, we have all the Titanic data set, and we said the thing that gave us the most information gain about whether or not they survived was what, whether or not they were male or female. We said now we're just going to look at the set of females. And of all the female passengers, the next highest gain piece of information is what class the passenger was in. So if the passenger was in the first or second class, less than two and a half, then we take the less, left subtree and we can see that um, it gets even more blue. If the class, if they were third class, the lowest class, we go to the right subtree. So the second biggest piece of information gain that the algorithm was able to determine was the passenger class. So if you were in the rich cabins, class one or two, which is usually towards the top of the ship, you're going to see that you have a, um, that's the next best decision to make and that your survivability rate is quite high. If you were a female in first or second class, you 16 of them died, 220 survived. So this is an incredible result because if you were a female, but in third class, you saw that you had roughly 50, 50 odds, 80 to 72. So we were able to see the most information gain. Then you can see the passenger class then gets divided again by first or second class. And that gives us a best indication. And we can see down here in the bottom left-hand corner that in this, in this uh, depth three node, we can see that of the 133 people who were females and in first class, 128 of them survived and only five perished in the wreck of the Titanic. So we were able to understand that if you were a first class female in, on the ship of the Titanic, if you had a first class cabin, you have a very, very, very high likelihood of surviving. And that's something that would have been very, very hard to discern by just looking at data. What I love about this is this is so interpretable. You can understand exactly what the computer figured out and you can explain this to somebody in a presentation. And then we can also go down to the other side that if you're male, the actual, the cabin class you're in didn't matter as much. We can see it probably, it matters down as we get lower, but if you were male, 
your age is a bigger factor in your survival, is the second biggest factor in your survival once we know you're male. So if you were, if your age was less than nine and a half, so basically if you were an infant or child, you had a better than even chance of surviving. While if you were at 10 years old or older, you had almost a five to one chance of dying just based on statistics. And then what, what class cabin you're in then further differentiates it. You can see first class cabin males had a better survivability rate than second or third class cabin males. Well, if we look at um, the number of siblings, having fewer siblings um, got you actually a better survivability rate than having a large number of siblings. Though we're getting to a pretty small sample size here. So what you have is you've got this great ability to interpret this data set. You've got this fantastic um, way to have the machine learn something about your data. So anytime you have a huge data set, I'm often throwing it through a decision tree just to see if there's something that splits the data quite evenly to see a huge differentiation. And the color really shows how just looking at the sex of the individual, you've got this huge differentiation. Then looking at the cabin of the individual, you've got this huge differentiation. But because the sex appeared higher in the tree, we know that the whether or not you're male or female, had a higher, was a more valuable piece of information. There's more information gain, gain in that than the class that your cabin was in. Though you can see the class your cabin in was in definitely influenced it. Another question from chat yeah. real quick. If the data points are missing parameters, is it possible to just only emit those points when calculating the probability at the relevant level of the tree? So you can create, you can create policies around the missing data, but that gets, Incre that gets increasingly complicated. By default, if you include it in there without any, by using just default parameters, you're gonna find it throws an error. So I can in fact do that real fast. Um, so if I go ahead and say, I wanna include this categorical value, um, like, or sorry, no, not the categorical value, uh, the missing data. So if we, so I'm going to bring back the original data frame, but I'm not going to filter out the rows. So I'm going to go all the way back to the top. And this is what I love about notebooks is like, yeah, here's a great question. Like what happens here? So I'm going to go ahead and re-import this data. Uh, so I've loaded this data set fresh again. I do need to do the binary encoding Again, so I'm gonna go ahead and encode the data one more time. And now I'm not gonna drop an A. I'm not gonna run the cell to go ahead and drop any data from this data set. So I'm gonna have missing values in my data set. So I'm gonna say my input data is still my input data. Um, but now if we look at my input data, my input data has this missing row in it. So it's got row 1305, it's got this NA in an age. What happens with the default argument um, algorithm? Yikes, input contains any in infinity or a value that's too large for float 32. So, and in fact, this value is NAN. So there's ways you can deal with it. You can say, okay, I want this policy to be performed, but by default that can influence the results of your data. So because of that, Python's gonna throw an error unless you've, um, correct, unless you've implemented a policy around what you wanna do with NANs because that's gonna influence your results. So, um, because obviously that data, you wouldn't know which way on a decision tree to go if um, you didn't have an age and if your split node was an age. Do you include them on both sides? Do you drop them at that point and say that they're dropped at that point? So there's a lot of decisions to influence how you might deal with that data. But by default, the easiest way to do it, especially as you're just starting and doing exploratory data analysis in the introductory level, you're going to want to just dive in and kind of get rid of the data that is messy or try and find a data set that's cleaner. But great question. So, but that's really um, what I've got. A decision tree is just the beginning. Like SK Learn is a huge gold mine of amazing algorithms. There's hundreds of different algorithms. You can do uh, random forest, you can do neural networks, you can do uh, k-means clustering. There's hundreds of different algorithms that you can think of. Um, 
And the great thing about is there's lots of tutorials available using this Titanic data set. It's one of Kaggle's data sets. Um, and it's, I use this data set because now you're familiar with it, you know what this data set looks like. So if you wanna dive in deeper, you're gonna find a lot of great resources on this Titanic data. But I think in doing all of this, never lose focus of the interpret interpretability of your results. You wanna make sure your results really, really make sense. I have a quick follow-up to the uh, last question. Is there a way to implement these kinds of policies with scikit-learn? Um, I don't, so to be completely honest, I don't know. Um, usually at that point, you're going off and using um, kind of more of a deep learning platform at that point. So you have both PyTorch, which is sort of a much deeper SK, like <coughs> SKLearn on steroids. Um, you also have like TensorFlow can do a lot of these very specific optimizations on um, a particular algorithm. So yeah, I find that if you're really doing like production data analysis, you're gonna very quickly find SKLearn does have some limitations and you're gonna find yourself using something like PyTorch. Awesome, we have a few more very general questions. Yeah, definitely. Oh, we have one more about decision tree actually. How do you determine the ideal height of a decision tree? Oh, that's tricky. So I, one thing we didn't really cover is the idea of a training set and a test set. And what you'll see quickly, the next thing you'd see in data science is you've got this idea that you're gonna have some training data where you're gonna train that data on maybe 80% of the data you have and then reserve 20% of the data for testing. And you're gonna wanna make sure to make the tree deeper and deeper as long as you're getting a better result on your test set. As soon as your test set starts seeing a decrease in quality in the result accuracy, then you're going to want to, and the test set is just basically, you're going to, you know what the survived value should be, and you're going to test what the decision tree predicts it to be by using decision, by using classifier.predict. And you're going to see what percentage of those were correct. So if, um, if you find that you have a 90% accuracy rate, with a depth of two and your accuracy rate goes up to 95% with a depth of three, then 97% with a depth of four, but then drop down to 92% with a depth of five, you've done what we call overfitting. So you'll generally find, you'll keep building a tree deeper and deeper until you see that your um, accuracy starts to plummet. Um, there's also, you can also inspect it. Like once you have trees that have nodes of just one or two pieces of data, those trees are gonna be overly specific and not gonna be generalizable. But that's a great question. Uh, one more question. Is that um, GINI value, the G-I-N-I value, the best way to determine the root node levels of the decision tree? Will changing around that parameter levels reduce accuracy? So, I mean, it's, it's sort of core to the decision tree algorithm. Um, I mean, you can't really change around those values. Certainly if you change your underlying data, the information gain is going to change, but there's a fixed algorithm that defines what the information gain is. And you can't, I mean, you, you can use, I guess, different metrics there, um, which will get you a different decision tree, but that's, I mean, I've never seen something like that done. So is it possible? Probably. Does anyone do it? No. And now onto some general questions. How do you gauge what kind of data set would produce interesting results after some analysis? And how do you direct your analysis to produce these interesting results? So I think the single biggest thing is a data that you're interested in the story of. Like, I think the story of the Titanic data set, for example, is fascinating. Like, I think the fact that I can talk about individuals that had this trip from Europe to America and um, were on the Titanic for a new, for a future life. Um, and you've got these Hollywood movies about it. Like the Titanic just sort of is this great story that really um, every, that a large part, of, a large part of society can relate to. Um, but more generally, I work on things that I find interesting. So I, for the GPA visualization that I built with students several years ago originally, like that, I wanted to know like, is, is math 241 really the hardest math course? Um, so do, is Calc 3 really that hard? 
And is there really one professor who's really, really harder than all the other professors who teach chemistry 104 or 105? So these were questions that I genuinely had. And like when I talked to students, they like gave me different answers and they were also interested in that question. So we built out some stuff and did a whole bunch of analysis to display that data. Um, I think if you're not personally interested in it, it's gonna, you're never gonna finish the project. Like it's gotta be data that you're like, this is cool. I wanna look at it more. I wanna nerd out more. And only when you can keep nerding out with the data uh, will you keep that motivation to keep going. So I think don't worry about what's interesting to somebody else. Just worry about what's interesting to you. What do you care about? What data do you want to nerd out with? And nerd out with that data. And don't worry about what other people might think. That kind of brings us to our next question. What do you personally find to be the most interesting part of data science and why? So I think data science is all about discovering things that we didn't know beforehand. That data, there's this vast just pools of data that by themselves doesn't look that interesting. But when you start dissecting them, you can learn so many insights from the data and you know it's true. You know it's all backed by data. So I think that's just, I feel like there's, I don't know, I, there was a talk I saw once that talked about like data scientists being like the sort of pioneers of today, just that they're the ones discovering new things. Um, and I think that's somewhat true, but I think that, so that element of discovery is definitely true that when you dive into a data set that nobody's do dove into before, you're finding out trends that nobody may have seen before. Like, and those trends can be huge. I mean, looking at like my latest stuff with COVID-19, like the trends that we saw back in early March that we, the United States were following falling just like seven days behind Italy and Spain. Um, so that basically if you map the two curves at wherever Italy was about seven days ago where you could almost predict exactly where the United States would be. And seeing those trends was something that data scientists really influenced into that conversation. That trend proved true for almost the first month of the coronavirus. So there's a bunch of data science that really has this real world relevance. And if it's data that you're fascinated by, just like, just go for it. Do you know what kind of classes here at UIUC would cover this kind of stuff in more depth? Yeah, there's a whole breadth of data science courses that go from sort of the simple data science. So like I was part of developing what we're hopefully gonna be launching in a year or two, which is an entire data science major at the University of Illinois. But um, the beginning point of that is a course called CS slash stat slash IS 107. That's really for somebody who has um, either no programming experience or very limited programming experience. And I got to develop that course with Carly Flanagan, who's a, another professor down in statistics. Um, so that's your introductory level course. If you're in computer science already, um, here at the University of Illinois, you've got courses like machine learning 440, um, as well as all the follow-on courses from that, including Applied Machine Learning AML, which I think is a 498 still, um, as well as a number of other kind of courses related to that field, including artificial intelligence. Um, you have, on the more visualization side, you have like Carrie Carla Helios teaches this great class called Social Visualization, which I think is 465. And that course really lets you dive into how you display data so it's not kind of your traditional data science course, but it really focuses on the visualization element, which I think is at least half of what data science is. And beyond that, I know there's a number of other units that are offering like field specific data science. Like I know um, atmospheric science has a couple of researchers who are doing a ton of data analysis on atmospheric data. So the, I think data science, there's gonna be more and more courses of it every single year um, and find something you're really interested in. Because if you hate atmospheric data, if you hate weather um, and you don't find clouds or the forecasting of weather interesting, you're gonna hate doing data science on data on weather uh, visualizations. Because as much of the fun stuff you see doing here, literally 90, I don't know, maybe not 90, 80% of what I do with a project is often just cleaning up the data and processing the data and making sure that the data looks right and is in the right format. So the fun actual discovery part is only 10 to 20% of the work. 
So you gotta really love the data to get through all of the boring hard work that you don't see that isn't sexy. It's the boring stuff. But if you're interested in the result, you're gonna power through it. A couple more questions. What quality does a data set have that would make a decision tree classification successful and vice versa? Uh, yeah, so decision trees require the data to be linearly separable. So if you, you can see that every decision is a binary decision. So you basically can draw a line through the data if you think about a graph that data. And um, if the data can be divided up into parts by drawing lines through it, a decision tree is gonna be very, very strong. Um, obviously, nonlinear data sets are going to, where the trends are not linear, are going to absolutely have terrible results with binaries, uh, with decision trees. So you're going to have some class of data that a decision tree, no matter how, how deep you go, no matter what training you do, is going to be just terrible. Um, so linear separable data is going to be that kind of data. The best thing is to try it out. The nice thing about SKLearn is literally we did I think three lines of code, we had an import line of code and we had a fit line of code and then we had a tree line of code. So we were able to build a decision tree in just three lines of code. See like if that doesn't work, um, something like a random forest is an algorithm that isn't, doesn't have to have linear separable data and still has some degree of interpretability some, sometimes. I, I think the big thing is kind of worrying about sort of can you interpret what's being outputted by the algorithm? How would the decision tree change if the end classification is not binary? Like you're classifying eight or so labels. Ah, so yeah, if the end classification is not binary, how does the decision tree change? It's still going to give you the most probable result. So uh, every classifier is going to classify it as one of the options. So if you have four different categories, you might have 100, 100, 500, 100 in a node of the decision tree. So clearly that third element, the 500 out of the 800 is the most likely outcome. And it'll still count, calculate the most information gained to get you to a single outcome. Obviously you're gonna need a much deeper tree if you don't just have a zero one output, um, but you're definitely, you have to have a discrete output space too because it is a classifier. It's not just a predictor. Awesome. Well, I think that's the end of our questions for today. Once again, thank you so much for hosting this workshop. It was wonderful. We really appreciate your time and thank you for doing all of this. Yeah, it's great to see the hackathon. I'm looking forward to seeing all of the amazing results you got. And while we talked about kind of Titanic data set here, I think there's a lot of great educational data to play around with. And um, hopefully I'll see some of your work and I may check out what you were working on over in the Discord. So I hear it's a happening place over there. So maybe I'll see you in the Discord. Yep. And real quick before we end our stream for our attendees, yeah. two quick things to plug. Um, our data science challenge is ending tonight at midnight in central, in central time. So if you want to submit something, please, please get that started um, and submitted. And lastly, I'm going to link a form here for our attendance form for our raffle. I'll link that in chat. The password should be 2020 visualization. So again, that's 2020 as in the numbers, 2020 visualization. Thank you, everybody, and a special thanks to Professor Wade for hosting this again. Thanks, Have everyone. Bye. Awesome. I think that is stream is done for now.